Good evening, friends, and welcome to Prophecy Odyssey. You can know the future by studying the Word of God. We'd like to welcome those who are joining us again across the country and around the world on the various networks and also watching online. Thank you for being a part of this international Bible study. And we also want to greet those here in Manhattan, New York City. Thank you for coming out tonight. We have a very important lesson. We're going to be talking about the Bible's longest time prophecy. So a lot of good information that we're going to be studying this evening. We also want to greet those who have contacted us who are watching from different places on the globe. And we want to send special greetings to those watching in Trinidad and Tobago. Also our friends who are watching in Nigeria, those in Mexico, those watching in India, in Poland, in Sweden, and England. So greetings to all of you. Thank you for reaching out to us and letting us know that you're a part of these meetings. If you'd like to let us know where you're watching from, just go to our website. It's just prophecyodyssey.com. There's a link that says contact us. Click on that and you can tell us what city you're watching from, what country you're in. And if we haven't mentioned your country yet, we will try to send you a special greeting tomorrow evening before we start our program. Also, for those here and those who are watching online, if you'd like to help offset some of the expenses for doing these meetings, it's easy. Just go to our website, amazingfacts.org or .com, and you'll be able to make a donation right there online to help with the expenses. Also, please remember our partner ministries. We want to thank 3ABN for broadcasting these meetings, also Good News TV, Hope International. So thank you for partnering with us in taking these messages to the world. Well, tonight we've got a free offer that we want to tell you about. Those who are here will be giving you this magazine following the program tonight. Uh, for those who are watching online, we've got a magazine. It's called Daniel and Revelation. It actually is an in-depth study of the prophecies found in these two books. This is our free gift to you tonight. If you'd like to receive it and you're in the U.S., you can uh, text the word Daniel24 to the number 40544 and you'll receive a digital download of that. You can scan the QR code, or if you're outside of North America, just go to the web website, prophecyodyssey.com. This is one of our thicker magazines because it's jam-packed with important information, talking about Bible prophecy. So take advantage of this. We want you to be able to read it and then share it with somebody else. You will be blessed. Well, of course, we've got a theme song that we've been singing every night, and we've got, well, this evening, tomorrow evening, and then Saturday morning. That's going to be the final time you're going to sing it. So let's stand together and let's sing it enthusiastically. God always thinks about us. God always thinks about us for good and hope and peace to bring us to a future home where time will never cease. He wants for us to know Him, to call upon His name. He gave His one and only Son to cleanse our guilt and shame. His ears are ever waiting, listening for our plea. His Spirit to renew our lives and truth to set us free. His kingdom and His righteousness must be our only goal. To seek for God with all our hearts and search with all our soul. To seek for God with sound good. Thank you for singing that. Uh, our prayer this evening is going to be brought to us by Pastor Diamond, who is pastoring in the Brooklyn area. Let's bow our heads as we pray. Our Heavenly Father, merciful and loving Jesus, thank you so much for this day, for life, for salvation, and for your infinite mercy to all of us. Thank you for bringing all of us safely to this place, to the Manhattan Center. And as we're about to study your word, we want to ask for a special blessing for your messenger, Doug Bachelor. Please bless him with a special power of your wisdom 
anoint him with the special power of your spirit and bless everyone who is here in this place and everywhere in the world those who are going to be watching us online and we are claiming your promise tonight that your word once spoken will not return void but will accomplish what you please you want us to have a changed heart and mind so as we continue Prophecy Odyssey tonight, we're asking you to help us to experience who you truly are, how majestic and how powerful you are, and how merciful and loving you are. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Thank you, Pastor. We've got a beautiful, special music at this time, How Deep the Father's Love, and Jackie Esposo is going to be bringing us that item. Jackie. Beautiful. Well, it's time for your Bible questions, and we want to thank those who have submitted Bible questions. If you're watching Friends and you'd like to submit a Bible question, it's easy. All you need to do is scan the QR code. We're going to put it up on the screen. Scan the QR code. It'll take you to our website, and you can just post your Bible question right there. We have this evening, a Friday evening, and Saturday morning. That's the last time that we're going to be able to answer Bible questions. So get your questions in now. And of course, those of you who are here, it's easy for you. You can also just scan that QR code. 
Well, once again, we're just delighted that Pastor Doug and Karen are leading out in our Bible questions. So let's give them a warm welcome this evening. Amen. Amen. Good evening. Good to see each of you here in Manhattan, New York City. Amen. And welcome again those who are watching on television, studying the Word of God with us. And we're hearing that there are literally millions of people that are tuning in via the Internet, Facebook, YouTube, not even counting all those that are watching on the TV networks. And so we're praying these programs make a difference in eternity. And you, the local audience, are making a big difference. We really appreciate your being here. Amen. Thank you. Are you ready for the first question? Let's get, we got a lot. We're going to try and... How many have come in so far? Many questions? Oh, 1,208. Yeah, so we'll see what we can do tonight. Or more. I'll have to look. Okay, are you ready? Yep. I know God has given us free will. If I pray for someone's salvation who is a non-believer, can God help this person to change their mind? Yes. Amen. There are examples in the Bible where you have individuals that are praying intercessory prayers to save others. Abraham prayed that Lot might be spared when uh, Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed. Moses prayed to spare the whole nation of Israel. God answered his prayer. Uh, the function of a priest is to also intercede. Samuel prayed that God would show mercy on the nation of Israel. And there are a lot of people, Jesus said, Peter, I've prayed for you that your faith not fail. And when you're converted, strengthen the brethren. And Jesus answered that prayer. So adding your prayers to God's desire to save gives God more permission to intervene in this satanic world to save and to put these people through circumstances and work on them through the Holy Spirit. Pray for people. Pray for your loved ones. Amen? Amen. Amen. How is it that God hardened Pharaoh's heart so that he did not let the people go, but then destroyed them because of it? Yeah, that passage confuses people. It's God said to Moses, I will harden Pharaoh's heart and he'll not let them go. And it's almost like God said, Pharaoh, sorry, I need a fall guy. I'm going to harden your heart. You're going to be lost. No, you read on and it says Pharaoh hardened his own heart. What God meant was, I am sending circumstances into the life of Pharaoh, and those circumstances are going to end up hardening his heart because he's proud. You know, you get the sunshine, and the sun shines on wax, and it softens it. And the sun shines on clay, and it hardens it. It's the same sunshine. It's the substance that makes the difference. Pharaoh had a proud heart, and the circumstances God sent hardened his heart. But Pharaoh made the decision. So last night we talked about how to be holy. Here's my question. How can I be holy when I sin every day? Well, we learned when we talked about sanctification, first of all, you become like what you look at and think about. And we read that it's important for us to, in um, Philippians, think on those things that are just and holy and pure and noble and good and right. You become like who you worship. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. We are transformed, Paul says, from glory to glory by the presence of the Lord. As you look at him, you bond and you become like him. Karen and I found a baby duck right after it hatched out in the wild. We kept it for a little while and then let it go and started following us. It thought it was a human. We couldn't get rid of it. It bonded. And so if we fix our eyes on Jesus, just like film, when you aim it at something, it captures the image, we begin to become transformed into his image. The Bible says when the apostles were filled with the Spirit, the scribes and Pharisees said, boy, they're bold. We notice they've been with Jesus because they were acting and talking like Jesus. So spend time with Jesus. Read his word. Pray. You become like him. Listen to good uh, programs and, and sermons yeah. and... watch Prophecy Odyssey. It makes a difference. <laughs> or, or, or many others. We yep. have a lot of other ones, yeah. Okay. Sometimes, though, we get a little discouraged because we feel like we're just not making it. But. Yeah, now, and that's a good point. Some people think, holy, holy is way up here. I'm way down here. How could I ever be like Jesus? Don't try and change in one day. 
but keep your eyes fixed on him. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Seeing then that we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily beset us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, let us run that race. So you're running a race and you may fall. Get up. Keep getting up. How many times did Peter fail? He kept getting up. He went out and wept bitterly, but he came back to Jesus and he became the mightiest of the apostles, or at least one of them. So Mary Magdalene, Jesus cast out seven devils, but she was the first one to witness the resurrection. Do not get discouraged. Amen? Jesus saved a man that was filled with a legion of demons. He can save you. That's right. We just need, we need to believe the promises and act upon them. So don't, don't act on your feelings, but know that God has chosen you and died for you. So that makes you very, very special. Amen. All right. You also talked about other things about being holy. Is a little bit of jewelry okay to wear? We talked about Christian standards, everything from diet to dress last night, and Alcohol. we did mention Christian adornment and jewelry, and someone said, well, how much jewelry is too much? Well, if you ask me, I don't wear any. And, and the reason I, there's, let me make it clear, are there going to be people in heaven that wore jewelry? Yeah. I, I want to be careful that people don't misunderstand this, but uh, some people are insecure about their appearance and they think by adding valuables to themselves they increase their self-worth and then can end up looking like a Christmas tree and you know it, you can make other people stumble and so I don't want to do anything I know one thing in the judgment day I'm not gonna stand before the Lord and he's gonna say Doug you can't make it to the kingdom why not Lord you Doug you did not wear near enough jewelry Whenever you're in doubt, do the safe thing. Now, listen to this. Did the children of Israel make a golden calf and turn it into a god? What did they make it out of? Aaron said they broke off the earrings out of their sons and their daughters. They fashioned it into a god and worshipped it. When Jacob went to meet before the Lord, he told his family, break off your ornaments, and he buried them. After the golden calf, God told the children of Israel, break off your ornaments that I can know what to do with you. When you get to heaven, you're going to get a crown and walk on golden streets. The asphalt in heaven is made out of gold. Why would you wear asphalt? Now, I could say more, but that's enough. <laughs> so I don't wear any, you know. I think, do the safe thing. Isn't she beautiful? She's not wearing any. Do <laughs> you want to tell your secret? <laughs> yes, please do. Women don't wear jewelry for men because if you've got a beautiful woman with jewelry, the man thinks, what a beautiful woman. He never says, boy, that jewelry makes her beautiful. Are you aware of that? How many men will say amen? Amen. 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 Okay. Especially if he's paying for the jewelry. <laughs> So these two guys are sitting together in church one we day. We have a lot more questions. No, no, questions. this I'll get. This is important. <laughs> okay. These two guys are sitting together in church one day, and this lady comes walking to church, and she's dressed to the nines. And this guy elbows his friend. He says, that guy's wife always looks like a million dollars. And his friend said, yeah, and it's costing him a million dollars a month to keep her looking that way. All right, I'm done now. I'm thankful that Jesus loves us and he shows us his love. So we experience his love before we realize all these, to take off the jewelry and yeah, things like gotta that. You've got to love Jesus first. Yeah, it's a, it's a love relationship. What happens, this is a tough question, what happens to all the unborn children lost to miscarriage and abortion? Serious and a tough question. Uh, let me begin by saying the Bible is clear there are going to be children in the resurrection. Uh, it says the, the little child will play on the hole of the venomous serpent there in Isaiah. Uh, it says that um, they will be playing, the Zephaniah, they'll be playing in the streets. There are children resurrected. People, Christians who have lost children through death will have their babies restored to them. The idea that every conceived or aborted baby is all going, they're all going to be resurrected, I don't know. 
Uh, I know they're innocent. They're certainly not going to be punished in hell because they've not committed any sins. There is a verse in the Bible where Job says uh, that I wished I had been like an unborn child that was carried from the womb to the tomb. I'm paraphrasing right now. That will be as though it had not been. So I don't know, friends. It's, it's a tough question. Because if you think about it, all the children that have died in infancy or through miscarriage, through all of the history of man, if every one of them is resurrected, heaven's going to be a nursery. We will be swimming in babies. So it's, you know, God can do that. I don't know. So don't go by Pastor Doug. I'm saying this by permission, not by commandment. But those moms who have lost their children, we'll have who their have children a relationship restored. with the Lord, those babies will be brought yeah, back to and them. And children before the age of accountability that, that love Jesus. They will be resurrected. God is merciful. That's yeah. what we just need to always remember. How does one know if his or her name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life? By faith. When we come to Jesus and we ask for his mercy, the Bible says in 1 John chapter 1, if we repent of our sins and confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, and your name is entered in the Book of Life as forgiven. Now, there'll be a judgment in the last days to find out if you have really had a change of heart, but your name will be entered in the book of life by faith when you come to Christ. Is the modern state of Israel in fulfillment of Bible prophecy? Well, uh, yes, uh, for a couple of reasons. One, there's a passage you read in the Gospel of Luke where it says, Jerusalem will be trodden down by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And some have understood that that would mean that the Gentiles would occupy that country until their time was up and it would ultimately be restored. And that's one verse. Some theologians argue whether that's pointing to that. There's another passage. There's a prophecy in Daniel chapter 4. Nebuchadnezzar has a dream where he loses his mind for seven years. And the first fulfillment of that dream is it says for seven years, you're gonna be like an animal and then your reason will be restored. He dreams of this great tree that feeds the whole earth and it shades the earth. And God says, Nebuchadnezzar, you're the tree. Some have wondered, is there a secondary fulfillment of that where a day would equal a year in prophecy? That would be 2,520 years Nebuchadnezzar had that vision about 572 B.C. If you go 2,520 years, that comes to 1948. What happened in 1948 to Israel? A Formed as a nation. Now, that would be a dual or a secondary application. First application is the historic one about Nebuchadnezzar. But there may be other prophecies. Paul says that he, in Romans chapter 9, he waits for all of Israel to be saved. Should Shabbat be celebrated according to the new calendar or according to the calendar given in the Bible? Because it isn't the same day, and this comes from Serbia. Now keep in mind, not everybody has heard every presentation, but we talked about this when we learned the Sabbath truth, that no change to the calendar ever affects the weekly cycle. So when they went from the calendar where they measured time by different kings, in the Bible, it says the third year of that king, the fifth year of that king. That's how they measured time. Then they started to measure time through, uh, you know, A.D. and B.C. and the Julian calendar, and they later switched, think 1582, to the Gregorian calendar. That never changed the weekly cycle. The days in the Bible have gone one, two, three, four, five, six, Sabbath, one, two, three, four, five, six, Sabbath, from the time of Adam. Moses had that reminded to him when the bread fell six days a week, right? Going through the wilderness, none on Sabbath. The Jews knew what day it is, and they've never forgotten that day. And if you look at any dictionary, encyclopedia, we have no question about what the first day is, the resurrection day. We call it Sunday, seventh day, Saturday. Muslims know what day is Friday. There's no question. All right, really quickly. Is it a sin for a girl to wear pants? I accidentally put on Karen's pants one day because she stuck them in my drawer, and I knew right away something was terribly wrong. 
So I, I just think you need to be practical. You know, if a girl's going to ride a bike or climb a mountain or something like that, obviously, a man should not put on a woman's garment. The Bible says, and a woman should not put on a man's gar garment, for all that do so is an abomination to the Lord. People, the Lord says he wants there to be a distinction in our genders. Take that up with God, not with Pastor Doug. All right. Well, thank you so much for your Bible questions. You can go to prophecyodyssey.com or you can go to the screen and do a screenshot and type your question in at that time. We're so thankful again to have Pastor John Lomakang and Jackie Jewel Esposa, and they will be bringing our music. John will be singing The Strength of the Lord. Sometimes life seems like words and music That can't quite become a song So we cry inside and we try again Wondering what could be wrong but then we turn to the Lord at the end of ourselves Like we've done a time or two before We find His truth is the same as it's always been We never will need more It's not in trying but in trusting, not in running, but in resting, not in wandering, but in praying, that we find the strength of the Lord. It's not in trying, but in trusting, not in running, but in resting. Not in wondering, but in praying. That we find the strength of the Lord. He's all we need for our every need. We never need. Still he'll let us go if we choose to live a life on our own. And then the only good that will ever be said of the pain we find ourselves in. There are places to gain and the wisdom to say I'll never leave him again for it's not in trying but in trusting not in running but in resting not in wandering but in praying that we find the strength of the Lord. No, it's not in trying, but it's in trusting. It's not in running, it's in resting. Not in wondering, it's in praying that we find the strength of the Lord. It's not in wondering, but in praying that we find the strength of the
Welcome once again, friends, to the Prophecy Odyssey Bible Study Spectacular. You can know the future. And tonight is going to be another example of just a fantastic study in Bible prophecy, one of my favorites. We're so thankful to be here with you in New York City again. And I am just so encouraged by the dedication of those who are coming night after night. And again, we want to welcome those who are watching online. We know that there are groups around the world right now that are hearing this in one of 14 or 15 different languages in churches in homes around the country and we're just uh, thrilled by the testimonies that are coming in tonight's study and by the way i want to remind you that you will have a copy of this it's dealing with the longest time prophecy and you can download this from the prophecy odyssey website we hope that you'll take advantage of the whole 15-part series. Uh, there is one bonus presentation where I share my testimony. But uh, these studies will really help you understand the foundational teachings of Daniel and Revelation. Well, we're going to start tonight with an amazing fact. And I like amazing facts. And here's an amazing fact from, well, you'd say history and science. The Hong Kong Zhuhao Bridge is the longest sea crossing in the world. The structure consists of a series of three cable-stayed bridges and an undersea tunnel and four artificial islands linking Hong Kong to the mainland China. This vast structure stretches more than 34 miles. One bridge, 34 miles across. And it crosses the Pearl River Delta. The bridge services 11 cities around the bay that's home to a combined 68 million people. I've been in the area, friends, and let me just tell you, there are a lot of people in China. Because it is such a busy shipping area, a section of this colossal bridge plunges underwater, allowing the barges to go by, and a four-mile stretch of it goes over the water, allowing ships to go underneath it. The structure required about one million cubic yards of cement to withstand the earthquakes and seasonal typhoons. The HZM Bridge was designed to last for 120 years and cost an estimated $18 billion. The Mammoth Project began in 2009. It took nearly a decade to complete because of delays and safety concerns, and 19 men died during its construction which incidentally is twice the number that died building the Golden Gate Bridge. The world's longest bridge, almost. Actually, the world's longest bridge is the cross that links earth with heaven. The Bible tells us that Jacob had a dream of a ladder that reached from earth to heaven, and angels of God were ascending and descending on this ladder, and that ladder, Jesus said, represents his life. Christ is the mediator. He's the escalator that makes it possible for us to make it to the kingdom through the cross. Now, we're going to be studying in our study tonight the longest Bible prophecy. Now, some people believe, you know, the longest Bible prophecy would be where you start with the creation of Adam and you've got those, those three epics dealing with 2,000 years from Adam to Abraham, 2,000 years from Abraham to Jesus, 2,000 years from Jesus' day to our day, then 1,000 years where we live and reign with Christ, 7,000 years, a day with the Lord is like 1,000 years. That's not really a prophecy. That's sort of um, a theory. We're going to uh, be talking about what would be the longest time prophecy dealing with a cleansing of the sanctuary, and we're going to talk about an Old Testament prophecy that foretold both the birth and the baptism of Jesus. Did you know about that? Looking at the book of Daniel, dealing with the sanctuary and the sanctuary on earth and the sanctuary in heaven. Fasten your seatbelts. We've got a lot to study, but we're going to find out what our people on the street have to say about some of these questions. First of all, can the Bible predict the future? All right. Of course, yeah, because we have seen that there's a lot of things right in, in the Bible that we actually see that there, we're seeing it happening. Yes, in Revelations. It's very clear. I think so. Sure. No. 
liked it. Of course, it's something you will see probably, you know, in the next life. Yeah, I think sanctuary is for everyone, and I think just, like, heaven is for everyone. I mean, I'd like to think that sanctuary is within ourselves. I think Isaiah was the one who first predicted the coming of Jesus. Sorry. The book of Daniel. When, Dan when Nebuchadnezzar had the dream of the image. In the 490-year prophecy, I'm wondering if it was symbolic. I think that it has to do with uh, restoring um, heaven on earth after Jesus comes back and uh, saves us. Is Jesus basically restoring, restoring heaven on earth? You know, for him to be able to dwell in a temple, they had to rebuild it to certain specifications. And I believe that's what it is, as far as I can remember. I think there's a level of peace that we get when we find finite answers to our questions. So if, if there's a certain time to it, it's, it's easier for you to prove it. So then you'll know when it happens, when it happens. So I think it has to do with giving us time to prepare for whatever prophecy has been given. So that we can be prepared for, and that we can know what's going on. Amen. God gives us these prophecies so we can be prepared. And the other reason he gives us prophecies, remember, Jesus said, when this comes to pass, then you will know that I am he. When he foretells things and they come to pass, we say, I can believe his word, and then I can believe he can save me and forgive my sins and that he's coming back. So prophecy is there really to increase our faith. Amen? Without faith, you cannot please God. Question number one. We're going to go right to our study for tonight because we have a lot to cover. Uh, I'm going to talk fast. Try not to talk too fast for the AI translation to keep up, but you need to listen fast, okay? The prophet Daniel had an amazing vision that you find in chapter 8 and in chapter 9 in which he saw a ram with two horns. What does that ram represent? So let me read to you from the book of Daniel. I'll start with the first verse, chapter 8. In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared to me, Daniel, after the one that appeared to me the first time. I saw in the vision, and so it happened, while I was looking, that I was in Shushan, the citadel, which is in the province of Elam. And I saw in the vision, and I was by the river of Uli. And I lifted up my eyes, and I saw there standing beside the river was a ram that had two horns, and the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and it came up last. All right, so we're going to, we might get a visit from the ram and the goat in our study here tonight. There they are, okay? Listen to what happens. By the way, in Daniel chapter 7, the four kingdoms are described by four unclean animals. Lion, leopard, bear, this other nondescript carniv carnivorous animal. When you get to Daniel chapter 8, now there are clean beasts. Shepherds dealt with sheep and goats and rams, okay? It tells us who this goat represents. As a matter of fact, I think I can jump to the answers in the slides right now, and it's going to help us make uh, better progress. What is the answer to that first question? The ram that you saw having the two horns, they are the kings of who? Media and Persia. It says one came up first, but the second one was bigger. The kingdom of Media started first. You read Daniel 6, it says in the year of King Darius the Mede, but then later you've got Cyrus the Persian, and the Median Empire kind of went down, and the Persian Empire got much bigger. Question number two. Daniel next sees a goat with a great horn between his eyes. And what does this mean? Who is the goat that we see in this vision of the, the goat and the ram? The answer is given in Daniel chapter 8, verse 21 and 22. The male goat is the kingdom of who? Greece, and the large horn between its eyes is the first, it's the first king, and as it is broken, four stood up in its place. That first king, it comes up, it's strong, Alexander the Great. When he dies, he dies young. When he is strong, in his midst of his power, he dies. He can conquer the world, but he couldn't conquer himself, and after a drunken feast, he came down with a fever. They don't know if it was poisoning or malaria, but he died with any, without any real strong air, and his kingdom is then divided among his generals. 
Four kingdoms shall arise out of that nation, but not with its power. They did not have the same centralized power that Alexander bore. Alexander was, uh, oh, they call him the great for a reason. Marched his army 11,000 miles in about 10 years. He conquered the Persians. You heard about the battle of the 300 Spartans. That was before Alexander. But the Greeks, they were a warrior nation. And Alexander's father, Philip of Macedon, he had Alexander taught by Aristotle and some of the great uh, uh, philosophers. And he was a very well educated, a great military tactician. And his kingdom spread. And look at the scope and the map of the Greek empire that Alexander spread. But then he died. And as he was dying, someone asked him, who will reign in your place? And he said, the strongest. And that's the way it usually works. And his four generals, they then began to carve up his empire among them. And you have this, now this goat that's got four horns. This is actually a real picture. This is not um, special effects. Every now and then you will find a goat that will produce four horns. I think this one's a sheep, a ram. So the four horns represent the four generals who took power over parts of the empire when Alexander died. And they, you can see their divisions here. There was one that was far to the east and the one that was to the south, the Ptolemies. You got the Seleucius to the east. You got Antiochus that was in the midst. And up north, you got Cassiander and Lysimachus. And so you've got this, this breakup of his kingdom among these four generals. Now I named, I included Antiochus. He wasn't until later. It's really Lysimachus that was in there. Number three, a little horn then springs up out of one of the four. What does that represent? Now, have you noticed so far the angel is telling Daniel exactly who these kings are? The angel says Persia, Greece, but now the angel doesn't give us an exact answer, so we need to go to the Bible. Because by the time when, when the angel is giving this vision to Daniel, nobody would have dreamed that Romulus and Remus in that village of Rome were going to become a world empire. And so it doesn't even give a name to it because they didn't have a name back then. A little horn then sprouts up out of one of the four. What power does this represent? From the northwest kingdom, it tells us a little horn comes up out of that Greek empire, overtakes it, and it turns into what? The kingdom of Rome, Claudius Caesar, and now I'm giving you scripture. Claudius Caesar had commanded that all the Jews depart from Rome. No question Rome was in control during that time. And because the Jews had been rebelling and Christians were associated with Jews, they both got persecuted. You can read in Luke chapter 2, who was it that told all the Jews to come and be taxed in their home village? Augustus Caesar. Rome was ruling. They were the undisputed rulers. During the time of Augustus Caesar, they had something called the Pax Romana. That means the Roman peace lasted about 40 years. And in spite of the problems of Augustus Caesar, he did really maintain peace. He believed in having a strong family. He was a strong leader. Rome began to disintegrate when they kind of fell into the secretaries were running everything and the Roman emperors were just going to the orgies and living for hedonistic pleasure and that's when Rome began to disintegrate. You can read where Pilate, who was appointed by Rome, he said, shall I crucify your king? They said, we have no king but Caesar. You remember that? So the little horn that comes up from one of the divisions of Roman Empire is talking about uh, Italy and Rome, and it's the Roman Empire, and it's really talking about two aspects of it. During pagan Rome, they persecuted the Jews. We know, of course, they destroyed Jerusalem. They destroyed the temple. They executed Jesus under the urging of some of the religious leaders. But then as Christianity grew out of Rome, you know, within a hundred years of the death of Christ, there were now more Christians, more Gentile Christians than there were Jewish ones. It exploded around the Roman Empire. And they were then persecuted by Rome. So Rome is that other power that you're reading about in Daniel 8. Remember, we're studying Daniel 8 right now. 
We'll go to Daniel 9 in a minute. Daniel was told that this little horn would defile the sanctuary how long until it would be cleansed. Now, here comes the time prophecy. This is going to be so exciting, so you've got to listen carefully. The angel said to Daniel, for how long? For 2,300 days, then the sanctuary will be cleansed. Now, what does this mean? And some of your Bible versions may say 2,300 evenings and mornings. They, both translations work. Let me explain what this is talking about. Once a year, how often? Once a year, the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies. It was what we call Yom Kippur or the Day of Atonement. And uh, he would have a cleansing of the sanctuary. It came once a year. So if you say 2,300 days of atonement, how many years is that? Happens once a year. That's 2,300 years. If you simply say 2,300 days, if a day is a year in prophecy, it's 2,300 years. So no matter how you dice it, it's 2,300 years that we're dealing with in this prophecy. Whether you say they're days of atonement that came once a year, or they're simply prophetic days and a day is a year in prophecy, okay? It says what would happen? The sanctuary would be cleansed. Is this talking about the priest cleansing the Jewish sanctuary? Can't be, that was destroyed you remember, when Jesus began his ministry, he told the Jewish people, take out these sheep and the goats and the doves and all the animals you're selling. You've turned it into a bazaar. My father's house is to be a house of prayer for all nations. You've made it a den of thieves. He said, my father's house. And Jesus taught daily in the temple, the Bible says. You remember? At the end of his ministry, when the religious leaders rejected his teaching, he walked out. You know what he said? Your house is left to you desolate. And he told the disciples, don't worship the temple. Soon there will not be left here one stone upon another. Christ said, destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will raise it up. And they said, it's taken 46 years to remodel the temple. How are you going to raise it up in three days? But the Bible says he spoke of his body. At the resurrection when Christ rose after suffering for our sins, the church was born. And you are the temple of God, Paul says. So a cleansing of the sanctuary is not just talking about the people, but God has a sanctuary in heaven. You remember last night's study? Moses built the sanctuary based on the pattern of a heavenly sanctuary, amen? amen. Where Christ intercedes as our high priest right now. The Bible says he is there at the right hand of the Father pleading. He ever, ever lives to make intercession for us. We have a faithful high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Jesus is our high, high priest in the real heavenly sanctuary, but he's got a sanctuary on earth. Now, how could the sanctuary in heaven need cleansing? Well, every time you sin, who takes your sin? How many believe our sins are washed away by the blood of Jesus? What is Jesus pleading before the Father right now? His blood. Are our sins always going to be in the blood of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary, or will it someday be cleansed? Doesn't the Bible say he is coming without sin unto salvation when he comes? What about the sanctuary on earth? Has it been defiled? What was it that was defiled? Look in Daniel 8, verse 12. It's on your screen now. It'll be there. There it is. Because of transgression, an army was given over to the horn. This is that little horn, that beast power. To oppose the daily sacrifices. The daily sacrifices when the people came for forgiveness through the blood of the lamb. And what would happen? The beast power said, you're not forgiven by the blood of the lamb. You're forgiven by the priest. You're forgiven by the power of the church or the pope or something else. But the Bible says you can go directly to Jesus. You don't have to go to a priest to be forgiven. Amen. You don't have to pray to a saint to be forgiven. You can go right to Christ through the Holy Spirit. Amen? The truth would be cast to the ground. So, would you agree during the Dark Ages the truth was cast to the ground? The truth about salvation being a gift was corrupted. The idea that we could go directly to Jesus was corrupted. The idea that we had to confess our sins to a priest 
It's not in the Bible. Or that babies should be baptized or they're going to burn in hell. Limbo's not in the Bible. Neither is purgatory. Let me read something to you. I, I really don't want to offend anybody because I want to emphasize once again, there are good people in many churches. Amen? Amen. Uh, Orthodox churches, Catholic churches, they're good Christian people. But let me give you an example of some of the things that changed where the church gave up Bible teachings in, and replaced it with tradition. The Bible teaches that we are not to bow down to statues. It's called the second commandment. A agreed? Amen. Amen. The Roman Catholic Church said that we should bow down to statues. Did you know they're just there in, go to Mexico, go to Spain. The Bible teaches all have sinned except Jesus. The Roman Catholic Church says that Mary was sinless. The Bible says that Jesus is our only mediator between God and man, 1 Timothy 2.5. Catholic Church says that Mary is a co-mediator with Christ. The Bible, and where is that in the Bible? That Mary's our co-mediator. It's a tradition they got from mythology. The Bible teaches that Christ offered his sacrifice on the cross once and for all. The Roman Church teaches that every time the priest celebrates Mass, he is re-sacrificing Jesus. The Bible teaches that all Christians are saints and priests. We are a kingdom, a nation of priests. Didn't we read that last night? Ephesians 1.1, 1, 1, 1 Peter 2.9. The Roman Church says that the saints and priests are a special caste within the Christian community and that the Pope has the power to declare a person a saint that we should pray to. Pope Francis really hit a home run in that he declared two popes to be saints at one event. That through, now think about this for a minute. If, if you have a saint that you can pray to and he can intercede for God and he can forgive your sins or whatever, and you have a man on earth who has enough power to create a saint, what's more powerful, the saint he's creating or the one who's creating the saint? That puts a lot of power in a human. Does that make sense? Amen. Friends, these are all facts I'm sharing with you based on the Bible. The Bible teaches that we should call no religious leader our father. That's what Jesus said. Call no man your father. You can call your daddy your father. He means do not call a religious leader your father for you have one father in heaven. Amen. Yet, of course, the Catholic Church and some other churches teach that. The Bible teaches not to pray in vain repetition, Jesus said, as the heathen do. And that means when you go to confession and they say, repeat this prayer 20 times, Hail Mary or our Father, that's called vain repetition. God is not impressed by your just chanting something over and over again. Prayer is supposed to be the intelligent conversation of your heart with the mind of God. Sort of an insult to just keep repeating the same thing like he can't hear you the first time. He knows what things you need before you even ask. He doesn't want your vain repetition. The Bible teaches to confess your sins to God because God only can forgive your sin. Isaiah 43, the Roman Catholic Church says you must confess your sins to a priest. This is just the tip of the iceberg. The truth was cast to the ground, and it says this beast power would practice and prosper, but a prophecy was made that God would cleanse the sanctuary on earth, and in heaven there would be a heavenly day of atonement. Let's see what happened. Number five, how did Daniel respond when he saw the little horn power persecuting God's people and distorting the truth. Now, Daniel's an old man at this time. And when he saw the tremendous persecution, not only what the Romans would do to the Jews, that his nation would be destroyed and the temple would be destroyed, broke his heart, but then he saw God's spiritual Israel being burnt at the stake and fed to the lions and driven to the hills and persecuted. Did Daniel care about his people? Most beautiful prayer in the Bible is Daniel's prayer in chapter 9 of Daniel. Read it as he's interceding for the people. It says, I, Daniel, this is Daniel 8, verse 27, fainted, and I was sick, and I was astonished by the vision. But no one understood it. He didn't understand. Maybe he told his friends, Hananiah and Mishael, they didn't understand it. And he knew eventually God would come and give him an answer. But the angel could not finish explaining the vision because he physically couldn't handle it. He passed out. So is God going to say, well, I guess we'll never understand? 
But God thinks in the ages. Years later, God comes back. It's years later, but for you, it's the next chapter. Chapter 9. The angel returns as a result of Daniel's reading the Bible and praying. You know what Daniel's reading? Prophecy. Daniel is reading the prophecy of Jeremiah that said after 70 years, God's people would go home. And he said, Lord, it's been 70 years. When are you going to answer this prayer? How long will you endure with your people? How much longer until the Messiah comes? This is the content and the thought of his prayer. And Gabriel comes. He says, Daniel, when you started praying, I left heaven. And here I am at the end of your prayer. Angels go really quick. Made it all the way from heaven to earth without getting pulled over and given a ticket because there is no highway patrol that can catch an angel. In the next chapter, the angel returns to complete the prophecy. How long was the additional time period included in the vision? You have your Bibles? Go to your Bible. We've got to read this. Daniel chapter 9. And we can't read the whole chapter. We'll never get through the study. But I want you to jump down to verse 25. And it says here, Oh, let's see. Yeah, go to verse 22. And he, the angel, informed me and talked with me and said, Oh, Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill and understanding. At the beginning of your supplication, the command went out, and I have come to tell you, for you are greatly beloved. Therefore, consider the matter and understand the vision. Well, wait, what vision? Daniel 9 has no vision. He's saying, I'm coming to give you understanding in the last vision. Chapter 8, it's the only other vision there was. You with me? He says, I've come to give you understanding in the vision, meaning this previous vision. Seventy weeks are determined for your people. Now, how many days in a week? Seven. Seventy times seven is what? 490. Saying, I'm giving another 490 years to your people to complete their mission and presenting and introducing the Messiah to the world. The Messiah would come through the Jewish nation, the seed of Abraham. By the way, Peter came to Jesus and said, How often shall I forgive my brother? Seven times? And Jesus said, I say not unto you seven times, but seventy times seven. A symbol for the mercy of God and the very number that God had given Daniel and how much more mercy he was going to give the Jewish nation to complete their task, okay? Seventy weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city. To finish, several things happen in that time period, listen. To finish transgression, to make an end of sins through the sacrifice of Christ, to make reconciliation for iniquity. Can you say praise God? Amen. We can be saved from our sin. To bring in everlasting righteousness through the Messiah. To seal up the vision, to complete this vision and the prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Christ, the word Messiah means the anointed. To anoint the anointed, the Messiah. Now he begins to explain, explain it. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem, here's your starting point for the prophecy. For which prophecy? Well, the first prophecy that you find in Daniel 8. It said there'd be 2,300 days and the sanctuary would be cleansed. He said, I've come to give you understanding. Here's your starting point for both prophecies. From the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. And the street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. If you read the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, you'll see all the trouble they had rebuilding the walls and the street and the city, even in troublous times. And after 62 weeks, Messiah will be cut off, but not for himself. Who is Messiah cut off for? For you, for me. He died in the midst of his life in his prime. And the people of the prince who will come, now when it says the people of the prince who will come, it's talking about the, the prince that is making war with God's people. The people of the prince who will come, the Roman power, will destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end of it will be a flood until the end of the war. Desolations are determined. That's the abomination of desolation. Now he's returning to the subject in verse 27 of the Messiah. Then he, the Messiah, will confirm the covenant with many for one week. 
But in the middle of the week, he will bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abominations shall one who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is determined is poured on the desolate. Now, you said, Pastor Doug, I didn't get all that. I know. We're going to go back now and review it. And I think it'll make more, more sense now. Okay? We read the passage. How long did the angel tell Daniel were determined or cut off for God's people, the Jewish nation, to do their most important work? Seventy weeks. How many days in 70 weeks? 490 in prophecy. How long is that? 490 years. Seventy weeks determined for your people. The angel Gabriel explained that he'd give the chosen nation an additional 400 years. They got to go back to the land. They rebuilt the city, the walls, in troublous times. And that took like 49 years. That's why it says that there would be another seven weeks when that would be happening. And they, uh, they were to present and proclaim the Messiah to the world. Number seven, what is the starting point for both the 2,300 day and the 70 week time prophecy. There's only one starting point that is given. Answer, Daniel 9 verse 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince, there'll be seven weeks and three score in two weeks. Now why does he divide it that way? Seven weeks were the first period of time building the city and the wall when they would go back with the permission and support of the Persian king. He actually helped subsidize it. And then it says, unto the Messiah Prince, there'll be seven weeks and 62 weeks. So seven weeks plus 62 weeks is how many weeks? 69 weeks. But the prophecy said there would be 70 weeks. How many weeks are missing? One. 70 minus one. 69. All the accountants here say, okay, Doug, speed up. We got that, right? I just want to make sure. I, I, I'm a slow learner. It took me a while. When I understood this, friends, I literally was jumping up and down because I said, wow. Jesus came right on time the first time, just as it was foretold. So when was this decree to go forth and build Jerusalem? It is in your Bibles, praise God. It's in Ezra chapter 7. God actually put it there. It's also in history. The Elephantine papyri gives strong support to our conclusion. The decree of Artaxerxes was issued and carried out in the year 457 B.C. Okay, that's the starting point. There were several decrees given by various kings that allowed them to go back, that allowed them to rebuild the walls, but the ultimate main decree was Artaxerxes, 457 B.C. All right, now, how do we crack the code? There's a time code here. We've learned that there are 2,300 days in Daniel chapter 8. Then there's another 490 days in chapter 9. Those prophecies overlap. They got one starting point. What is a day equal in prophecy? Year. Year. And as I said, in Daniel chapter 8, it says 2,300 evenings and mornings, 2,300 days of atonement. By the way, the Day of Atonement is right around the corner for us Amen. right now, if you didn't know that. That came once a year. It's 2,300 years. I'm giving you three verses here. Take a picture of the screen and look them up for yourself. It's also in your lesson for those watching online. You can download it at prophecyodyssey.com, Ezekiel 4.6, Numbers 14.34, and Jesus in Luke 13.32. They came to Jesus. They said, you better go hide from Herod. He killed John the Baptist. He's going to come for you next. Jesus said, go tell that fox. I teach and I do cures and I cast out devils today, tomorrow, and the third day I will be completed. Jesus says this six months into his ministry. He did not preach three more days. He preached three more years. Christ made a prophecy. He used a day for a year. Can you say Amen. So if you're following Jesus, you're safe. You got 2,300 days. All right, so first thing you notice is the starting point for, let's look at the 490-year prophecy because it comes first. If you go 490 years from 457 B.C., it comes to 34 A.D. What happened then? Not going to tell you yet. Stay with me. Because you'll notice that the angel then carved up 
he carved up that 490-year prophecy. First, he said there'll be seven weeks, and that's the time they built the wall and the street in troublous times. Then there'll be another 62 weeks. Seven weeks and 62 weeks is 69 weeks. To anoint the most holy. What happened in 27 A.D.? See, 69 weeks has 483 years. You, have, you see it on the screen? Can you all see it? Amen. You with me? 483 days, a day is a year. 457, if you go 483 years, it comes to 27 A.D. What happened in 27 A.D.? Question number eight. The angel said when counting 69 weeks from 457 B.C., it would come to the Messiah, the Prince. Did it happen? Now, that means the Messiah, the Prince, beginning his ministry as the Messiah, the Anointed One. What happened? Acts chapter 10, verse 37. That word you know that after the baptism which John preached, how God, what's the word? Anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. When he came out of the water, the Holy Spirit came down like a dove and he began his preaching and his teaching ministry after returning from the wilderness of temptation. Amen? Amen. When was that time? I am so thankful for Dr. Luke who wrote the book of Luke who was an excellent theologian. And if you read, Luke gives us like six benchmarks in history. He tells us about Pontius Pilate. He tells us about Tiberius Caesar. He tells us what year. He tells us who's reigning Philip and Trachonitis. And he tells us all these historical pinpoints. And then he tells us Jesus being 30 years of age, because he was old enough to be baptized. And this is all in that one chapter, chapter three of Luke. It is one of the most well-established and documented dates in history. You don't have to be confused. 27 A.D. was the only time in history that those high priests, their lives overlapped with Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate, Herod, and all those events that were happening. All the stars just intersected 27 A.D. exactly when the prophet Daniel said, if you go 483 years after 457, the decree, the Most Holy is anointed. Do you know what that means? They not only knew when he would begin his ministry, but if you knew he could not begin his ministry until he got old enough to serve as a priest or a rabbi, which was 30 years of age, you could count back 30 years and figure out when he would be born. Which is why the shepherds were looking for him that's why Simon in the temple says, God has shown me that I would not die until I saw God's salvation when Joseph and Mary brought the baby to the temple. It all happened right on time. So, I think we're beginning to crack the code here for the baptism of Jesus. But then, you got one more week that's added on because you still got a total of 490 years. What happens then? Look, it says here that Jesus is baptized. You got one more week. Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom. How did Jesus begin preaching? The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. What time is fulfilled? Christ starts preaching the time is fulfilled. The time of the prophecy of Daniel about the Messiah beginning his ministry. Christ was talking about that prophecy. Jesus referred to the prophet Daniel in his teaching. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Number nine, what was to take place next in the prophecy? It said in the midst of this last week, before you get to 34 AD, halfway between seven is what? Three and a half, right? How long did Jesus preach? Three and a half years. Three and a half years after he preached, he caused the sacrifice to cease. It says after the 62 weeks and the seven weeks, which are 69 weeks, Messiah is cut off, but not for himself. He confirms a covenant with many for one week. Now, how does that work? He's cut off in the midst of the week, but he confirms a covenant with many for one week. Friends, I've got to tell you something here. Listen carefully. Among Christians, there is a great divergence on what this verse means. Good Christians, but you've got to get this right. There are many 
evangelicals, left behind Christians that think the one who is confirming the covenant is the Antichrist. We're saying there is no example of the Antichrist making a covenant with anybody. It's Christ who made a covenant with his people. And in the midst of that last week, he is cut off. So we got to get this right. Can you see how wrong you can be on that? They think the Antichrist is going to come and they're going to rebuild this physical temple and in the mid three and a half years later, all these things are going to happen. This whole scenario that is very different from what Protestants used to believe. After the 69 weeks, he causes the sacrifice to cease. Why? Because he dies. Did I give you the last answer? In the middle of the week, he brings an end to the sacrifice. Three and a half years after Jesus is preaching, do you realize when Jesus first started preaching, he did not tell his disciples, go to the world. No, no. Matter of fact, Gentiles came to him. He said, I'm sorry, we are sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel because Daniel said there are still, there's still seven more years for the Jewish nation. We're going to exclusively share the gospel with them so they're prepared to preach it to everybody. Why did Jesus pick 12 Jewish apostles? I mean, couldn't he have picked some Gentiles and thrown them in? It was not time yet, right? It says they are the ones who are to proclaim the Messiah, the seed of Abraham. So Christ dies on the cross exactly three and a half years later in the middle of that last week. Our Passover is sacrifice for us. But the disciples did not go immediately to the Jews. Jesus said, wait in Jerusalem until you receive the Holy Spirit. You'll be given power on high and I do not want you to go yet in the way of the Gentiles. I want you to preach to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. They get it first. Doesn't Paul say to the Jew first and then the Gentile? Why? Because they needed the less work. They already had the background. They had the scriptures. They were waiting for the Messiah and they make pretty good preachers if I say so myself. <laughs> Only half Jewish. All right, sorry. So, three and a half years go by. Some people take this last three and a half years or this last week and they cut it off from the 490 years. They float it near the end of time and they talk about seven years of tribulation. How many of you have heard of seven years of tribulation? Show me in the Bible where it says seven years of tribulation. They may get that because there were seven days when Noah was in the ark and life went on outside and I don't know where they get it but there's no statement that says seven years of tribulation. They take this last week off of Daniel's prophecy, they tear it and they float it and they say we don't know when it's going to start again but there's no example in the Bible of separating a time prophecy like that and putting that last week where you want. It's all one prophecy together friends, amen? All right, listen to what it says here. Jesus told his disciples to focus their preaching first on what group? He said, do not go in the way of the Gentiles, but go rather to the lost sheep of who? The house of Israel. For the next three and a half years, they exclusively preached to Jews until Paul, I'm sorry, Peter had a vision in 34 AD on the rooftop praying that he should now go to the Gentiles. When did that happen? Seventy weeks are determined for your people, for the holy city, to finish transgression, to make an end of sins. Now notice this. How could they, Jesus died and ascended to heaven. Why does it say he'll confirm the covenant with many for one week? Listen, listen, this, if you get this, it makes sense. What do we do with that last three and a half years? Hebrews chapter 2 verse 3 is your answer. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first, first three and a half years, began to be spoken by the Lord in person and was confirmed, using the very same word as Daniel, by those who heard him. Jesus said, as the Father sent me to the apostles, he says, no, I send you. I went and I confirmed the covenant for three and a half years. I died on the cross. The veil in the temple was rent. I caused the sacrifice to cease. I am now the Lamb of God, but you must confirm the co covenant for three and a half more years. What happened exactly three and a half years later? Stephen is stoned. Read Acts chapter 7. Stephen, who was the first martyr, he preaches before the Jewish Supreme Court, the leaders of the nation. Jesus would have saved them. He said, I'm giving you more time. 
he made a powerful appeal. He said, I see the heavens open, I see Christ, he's the Messiah. And you know what they did? They plugged their ears. What does it mean if a judge plugs his ears? And they gnashed their teeth. They took him outside the city just like they had taken Jesus outside the city three and a half years earlier. And they executed him without the benefit of a trial. And the clothing was laid down at the feet of Saul, just like the clothing was gambled of Christ. And Stephen said, Father, forgive them. Lay not this sin to their charge, just like Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They know what they do. It's a repeat of what happened through Christ, but now it happens through an apostle. That's 34 AD. And you know who was watching this execution? Paul. And it says a great, Acts chapter 8, a great persecution then arose in Jerusalem and the Jews were scattered everywhere preaching. And the next chapter, Paul is converted and he becomes an apostle to the Gentiles. 34 AD, the gospel explodes among the Gentiles through Peter and Paul. So three and a half years, Jesus confirms. Three and a half years, the apostles confirm to the Jews Stephen is executed. The Jews as a nation rejected the gospel. And that's why Jesus said, woe to you. The temple's going to be destroyed. The prince is coming. He's going to, the abomination of desolation is going to happen. By the way, it's happening again in the future too. Number 11, who is God's chosen nation? 1 Peter 2 verse 9, following AD 34, the kingdom of God, Jesus said, will be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth its fruits. Now, can Jews still be part of that chosen nation? Amen. Yes, but can Gentiles be part of that chosen nation? Amen. We, Jew and Gentile, we are grafted into the same tree. Amen. And Jesus is the only Messiah for Jew and for Gentile. There's no other choice, friends. Amen? There's only one name given among men whereby we must be saved. He is not a Jew who is one outwardly, but he is a Jew who is one what? Inwardly. Number 12. According to the angel who spoke with Daniel, what final event would begin the end of the 2,300 years? Okay, now everybody understands we've covered the 490-year prophecy. It reaches the 34 AD. The Messiah was introduced. Pentecost, the Jews announced the Messiah to the world. Then during that crucifixion or that persecution, they announced the Messiah to the world. What happens next? We're going now to Daniel 8. It said the sanctuary would be cleansed. You still with me? All right. He said to me, for 2,300 days, then the sanctuary will be cleansed. Cleansed from what? Christ, our high priest, the sins of everybody who's ever sinned. He is bearing our sins. He is the sin bearer. He is in the temple of heaven as our high priest. Amen? Amen. And he has a sanctuary on earth. You are his sanctuary. Amen? Amen. All right. You got the 490 years, the 70 weeks, that's completed. There's a remaining prophetic time. If you go from 34 AD and you add that remaining 1,810 years, when does that come to? 1844. Pastor Doug, I don't remember hearing about that in history. What's going on in 1844? It actually was a very pivotal time in history. For one thing, there's a great revival around the world. Many people thought when they studied the prophecies of Daniel that Jesus is going to come. I'll give you a little amazing fact you probably don't know. How many have heard of the Baha'i religion? The Baha'i religion. The Baha'is, they also opened the prophecy of Daniel. They studied the same prophecy. They said, you know, that comes to 1844. They use that same date. Interesting because it's the only date it comes to. Would you like to know when communism was born, Karl Marx wrote his manifest in 1844, and atheism began to spread around the world. I'll give you a few quick amazing facts. Who wants to know what the first email message was? First email message was Robert Morse who invented Morse code, and the first message was from the Bible. What has God wrought? That was the first message. You know when he did it? 1844. Evolution is spread around the world. Where did that come from? Charles Darwin. You know when he got his theory during his HMS Beagle excursion? Guess what date? 
1844, the Codex Sinaiticus Bible discovered in St. Catherine's Monastery. 1844, the Edict of Toleration is passed allowing Jews to come back and settle in the Promised Land. 1844, you got the birth of evolution, the birth of atheism. All these things are happening. The Industrial Revolution, Frederick Nietzsche says God is dead. Joseph Smith, founder of the Mormon Church, who I believe is a counterfeit Christianity. No, I don't want to be unkind, but that's just what I believe. He dies in 1844. Brigham Young goes to, uh, goes to Utah. I mean, it is a pivotal year. There are seven ages of the church. It starts with Ephesus, the first age of the church, and then you got Smyrna. And as you go through the different ages of the church, you get to the last age of the church, which is called what? Laodicea. It means a judging of the people. Christ is our high priest. The final judgment before he comes is beginning. The day of atonement was a time of judgment. Christ has served as our high priest in heaven from his ascension. In 1844, there are two apartments in the sanctuary. He entered his final phase. A judgment began according to the books that are written. So, number 13. When Jesus ascended to heaven, where did his ministry for us continue? Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Christ came, Hebrews 9:11. Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with a greater and a more perfect, what? Tabernacle, not made with man's hands. That is not of this creation. He is in the heavenly temple, friends is our high priest. Amen? Amen. When he cried, died on the cross, the purpose for the earthly temple is over. It's not going to be rebuilt. Number 14, does God still have a temple on the earth? What does it say? Ephesians 2, 19, the households of God has been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitly framed together grows into a what? A holy temple in the Lord in whom you are being built together for a dwelling place of God. All right, let's look at our chart. We're going to put our chart up on the screen here, and we're going to also have a three-dimensional version of the chart here, and I'm going to go through this very quickly. Let me see. You got it up here where I can see it? All right. So here we've got the beginning is when? 457. You got the first 490 years that reach to the baptism of Jesus that takes place when? 27 AD. This is the time for the Jewish nation. For the next three and a half years, Christ confirms the covenant in person. And then he causes the sacrifice to cease. He dies on the cross. But he said, don't go to the Gentiles yet. Go to the lost sheep. For the next three and a half years, the, disciple is pre the gospel is preached through what? The apostles to the Jews. But they reject, the Supreme Court rejects the message of Stephen, and their time is cut off as a nation. Now the gospel is scattered everywhere, but we've still got time left for the cleansing of the sanctuary. God's church would be cast to the ground. The truth would be cast to the ground. Now, if you go that remaining period of time, that 1810 years, I'm sorry, uh, 483 years, no, I'm getting it wrong, 1810 years, you come to the time 1844. Do you know what else happened in 1844 along with Karl Marx and Charles Darwin and all these things that are going on that year, the last phase of the church? God began a movement where Christians put aside their differences. And they said, why is the Christian church so divided? God said, all men will know you're my disciples by your love for one another. Are you aware, Jesus said, I have other sheep that are not of this fold? Them I must also call, and there'll be how many? One fold. Do you know when Jesus comes, you're going to have two groups? Mark of the beast and the seal of God. Don't miss Sabbath morning. We're studying that. The mark of the beast and the seal of God. What's going to happen before Jesus comes? There's going to be a shaking in Christianity, and there's going to be a revival, and God's people are going to return to the word of God, and the sanctuary is going to be cleansed from the false teachings of the dark ages. That began in 1844. God began a movement that is the fastest growing Protestant church in the world today, and it's called the Seventh-day Adventist Church, friends. 
and it is spreading all over the world because it's calling people who love the Bible back to the Bible even if it's not popular. Jesus never said it's going to be popular. He said the truth will set you free. This prophecy has that all outlined. He is now cleansing the temple in heaven. He's not done. When he's done and Michael stands up, there'll be a time of trouble such as there never has been. And praise God, he's not done cleansing on earth either. Amen? Or you and I'd be in trouble. But someday, the laundromat will close. We need to take advantage of the blood of Christ now, friends. Can you say amen? 1844, as Jesus, our high priest, began cleansing the heavenly temple, a revival, a phenomenal movement began. People everywhere began to turn. Christ is coming for a church that is turned to the doctrines that were once delivered to the saints. They're not going to keep nine commandments or eight commandments. You don't get a 20% or a 10% discount. Can you say amen? amen. They, the devil is going to be angry with the church that keeps the commandments of God and has the faith of Jesus. Number 15, what unique aspect of his redemptive ministry did Jesus commence for his church in 1844? The time has come, the judgment must begin where? At the house of God. The names of those who have claimed to be Christians, they're going to be checked out before they're given admittance to heaven. Angels want to make sure before we get back in, we don't cause the trouble Lucifer caused. Amen? There's a judgment going on. Do you not know, Paul, uh, Solomon says, God will bring every work into judgment with every secret thing. Friends, I want my sins under the blood. I don't want you to know my secret things. Can you say amen? So I've got to hasten to the end. There's good news here for you. Jesus is our high priest in heaven. We don't need to be afraid of his final judgment. You know why? It says the court is seated. Number 16, our great hope is that Jesus is our advocate. Can you say amen? 1 John 2, 1. He is our judge. He is our faithful and true witness. If you go to court and you've got the best defense attorney, <laughs> he's your judge, he's your friend, he's your family, and he's your witness, you're in good shape. Amen? You don't have to be afraid of the judgment. If you fear God, you won't be afraid of anything else. If you don't fear God, you'll be afraid of everything else. How many want to give their hearts to Christ tonight, friends? Be part of his people. Amen? God bless you. I want you to pray with your groups as we go off the air. I'll be praying here in Manhattan with our local group. And don't miss our next study tomorrow morning. We're going to be talking about tomorrow night, Babylon and the USA. Don't miss it. Tomorrow night. Amen? I'm talking too fast.